Hey, everybody, this is Chris and Kathy from Petability Podcast. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to Petability Podcast through your favorite streaming app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Petability Podcast and share our content on social media. You can also support the show by making a donation. Simply go to our website at petabilitypodcast.buzzsprout.com and click on the heart symbol at the top of the page. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good afternoon, Kathy. How are you? I'm very good today, Chris. It's very, very crisp and chilly here today, so I'm nice and warm inside <laughs> with my pug. With warmer temperatures, is coming rain, though, so I made sure that I got out and walked the dogs before this uh, podcast interview. Smart, because uh, I did too, and um, as you know, as a rule, uh, pugs do not like to get uh, wet. Um, it's probably a law written down somewhere, I don't know, but um, <laughs> you can't get wet, or you get no, you get no pooping. <laughs> right, get wet. exactly. So, exactly. Uh, so um, I'm glad to be inside. Well, another great topic today that we have been yearning for, for about a year now since we yeah. started this podcast, yeah. and that is to discuss cranial cruciate ligament tears, CCL tears, in our canine friends. Such an important topic, and I'm really, um, I'm really excited to talk about it today because I think as, as somebody who's a rehabilitation practitioner, this is probably the most common thing I see in rehab. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And to that end, we have an expert with us, Dr. Marianne Nieves. And we have known each other, unbeknownst to us, we actually had a mutual friend and, and that kind of uh, was a connection. But um, Dr. Nieves referred uh, to me many, many a dog over the years. And Kathy, we've both talked about how fortunate we are in this area in New England to have such fine veterinary surgeons to uh, refer pets to us for rehabilitation. Right. Um, my goodness, we are so lucky. And um, we've been, uh, we've, we've sent many a case to uh, Dr. Nieves and she's taken very good care of all of our furry friends. And um, she may not, I'm not sure if she knows this. We may also have a mutual friend. Um, I have a, a good friend who's since passed, my friend, um, Dr. Wolfson, Dr. Joel Wolfson. And um, he was just a phenomenal, phenomenal surgeon and phenomenal uh, human being. And I remember him speaking so highly of Dr. Nieves. And for me, that, that spoke of volumes. Right, right. So a little bit about Dr. Nieves. So before joining Blue Pearl in Waltham, Massachusetts, she taught clinical and didactic small animal surgery and dentistry at Iowa State University. And indeed, that is our connection because our listeners know that I am originally from Iowa and my hometown was about 40, 45 miles uh, west of where Iowa State is in Ames, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our family friends who has a phenomenal Christmas Eve bash every year and invites practically the whole community, um, actually was was friends or is friends with, with Dr. Nieves because they both worked at uh, Iowa State University. So small world. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she served as a surgeon, as Anita Rose, at several other teaching institutions, including Atlantic Veterinary College, Mississippi State University, and Louisiana State University. She performs and enjoys soft tissue, orthopedic, and neurosurgery, but has a special interest in surgical oncology, orthopedic, and maxillofacial surgery and pain mm. management. Mm. Dr. Nieves is a reviewer for the Journal of the American Animal Hospital Association. That's a big deal. Yeah. And she has many certifications, but I think uh, one that, that I always tell people to, to definitely look for is, you know, make sure that your surgeon is boarded. 
And so <laughs> she is a diplomat with the American College of Veterinary Surgeons. And in her spare time, whenever that may be, she enjoys time with her family, including her four-footed Milo and uh, coastal and deep sea fishing, which I find fascinating, sailing, hiking, gardening, and traveling to see family and friends. So welcome, Dr. Marianne Nieves. Welcome, Dr. Nieves. Thank you so much, uh, two of you. Um, that was a lovely introduction, and I do have very fond memories of Dr. Wolfson, and uh, he'll always have a special place in my heart. So, uh, yes, I'm excited to, uh, to answer questions about cranial cruciate disease. It's the most common orthopedic injury that we see. So, um, you know, there's a lot of great questions and concerns about them from owners. Maybe we could, um, maybe we could jump right in and, and start with explaining to our listeners what the anatomy of the dog's knee uh, looks like? You know, is, is it similar in structure to the human knee? It, it is very similar. I mean, the difference is obviously that we walk straight, um, most of us, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> whereas uh, dogs are have a flexion to that knee, um, so they're always a little bit flexed. Um, there are certainly some breeds that are straighter than others in the knee, um, and we can talk about that later, um, but uh, for the most part, it's, it's very similar. Um, mm -hmm. You have the, the femur on the top um, and the tibia below, and in between lies the, the stifle joint or the knee. Um, and the other difference is that in people, the very top of the tibia is flat, whereas in the dog, the top of the tibia has a slope. Um, and it slopes from, from cranial or forward to caudal or backward. Um, and the degree of that slope really um, is not uniform among species uh, or among breeds within a species. So that can make it a little bit of a challenge, um, but it also can predispose uh, patients to uh, early rupture. In uh, relation to the anatomy, what is the function of the cranial cruciate ligament? Uh, Kathy and I have kind of joked in the past that that clients unwittingly will come in and say, and say, my dog has the CCL or my dog has the ACL. And we're like, yeah, they all do. And they actually have two. <laughs> What's hap what happens to it? Yeah. Okay. So the cranial cruciate um, and it's cranial in, in the dog um, and anterior in people, just because of the fact that in people it, we're don't we're um, talked about as, as front and back or in, anterior and posterior. And in the dog, it's cranial and caudal. And so that, that does tend to confuse some people, but it's just really a nomenclature between the species. So um, in the dog, it's the cranial aspect and the caudal aspect of the knee. So the cranial cruciate runs from the caudal aspect of the femur, which is the bone above, to the cranial aspect of the tibia, which is the bone below. And so its whole function is to basically prevent a forward translation of that tibia um, as the dog walks. Um, so you can see there's also the caudal cruciate, um, which has the opposite effect to keep the tibia from translating caudally. Um, and we're still trying to figure out uh, for caudal cruciate tears, um, the importance of those tears and how that influences um, the dog's lameness or gait. Um, but for right now, we're, we're not gonna add um, those confounders, but oftentimes with dogs with cranial cruciate rupture, we can see some minor tears with the caudal cruciate as well. Hmm. Um, and so then one of the other things that is also very important in the knee, um, and I think it's often talked about in the human just because it can happen as a tear of by, by itself without tearing the cruciate ligament, and that's the, the medial meniscus. Um, and the medial meniscus is very prone to injury when you have a cranial cruciate tear. Anyway, I, I, when we were doing the introduction, Chris and I were talking and I was saying to Chris that, this is probably the most common orthopedic condition I see in rehab, you know, either, um, you know, partial tearing or complete tearing and, and, and post-op surgery of the CCL. So but why is it so common in our dogs? What's happening that makes this, so, I mean, would you say that you would experience that too as well? Is this the most common thing you see orthopedically? Well, absolutely. And, and I think it's very multifactorial um, and really kind of gets into the whole reason for why we have tears. But um, and I, and I don't want to jump the gun on any other questions that we might have, but um, first of all and foremost, I mean, this is, this is a, uh, an injury of athletes. 
right? And most of our dogs are athletes in some fashion, whether they think themselves as athletes or not, or whether they actually are or not, but just by the nature of the things that they do. You know, certainly we expect them to run along bicycles and go up and down mountains and play in the woods and, and, and run free in dog parks and things of that sort. Um, and also they, if they aren't um, athletes in that sense of the word, you know, they can also be Frisbee players. They can be dogs that are in, um, uh, in other types of um, uh, performances, you know, where performance athletes, where um, they're in agility or anything that way. But we also have the dogs that just kind of like to sit in the backyard, but when they see a squirrel or something, then they'll haul to, you know, go into <laughs> that wildlife. And, and it's those types of injuries because typically we think about it as ter- of being a hyperextension injury of that knee. Um, so whether that is a hyperextension injury because they just jumped off the bed um, and it's really tall and they've hyperextended their knee or jumping on or falling down some stairs or jumping up and grabbing the Frisbee, you know, it's just the kind of pressure that is placed on that cranial cruciate ligament. I think you make a really good point too about our about our dogs being athletes and whether people think about it or not. I mean, I have a pug, you know, and maybe you wouldn't think of my pug as being an ath- an athlete, but our dogs perform feats of athleticism every day. Yeah. Every day. I do. Yeah, I, th- I think about, uh, you know, my little Cavaliers just jumping up on the couch, you know, and if I were to do that, like at the same proportion, that'd be like, you know, me jumping up, you know, onto a piece of furniture that's like eight feet high. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Those dogs are more more um, able to handle that, whereas others aren't, you know, yeah. so the couch potato may not be able to handle, you know, that little brisk, um, you know, trot with a new dog in the backyard, whereas, you know, it may be that um, the lad that's been doing this for a long time is, although he's an athlete and he can handle it, that still doesn't make him any less prone. Mm. It's just like our football players, you know, they're no less Mm. prone, even though they're well conditioned, they're no less prone to having a cranial cruciate tear. Well, something you said was definitely of interest to me in that I thought, and this is what I've been preaching for years, that the tear of the cranial cruciate ligament is a gradual wear and tear process based on the biomechanics and that that femur wanting to kind of roll down that slope, pushing that tibia forward, that there's a tug with every step they take on that cruciate. And so it it tends to just degrade over over time versus being kind of this one-time assault, like a in a person who may go skiing, catch an edge on their ski, and you know get that hyperextension and tear their their ACL. Am I wrong in that? Hearing no, what you're saying, I, I don't. I think it's multifactorial. Um, I don't think you can think about it in an isolated way. Um, there, there are certainly lots of evidence to indicate that there is a degenerative process. Um, the thing that I still find hard with that is that it's still going to be hard to kind of look at it from the chicken and the egg. You know, when you're looking at it, you know, are are there other factors that you haven't included? I mean, obviously these dogs are not just, you know, um, kept in isolation where they're not um, undergoing the kind of stresses that we are talking about to this ligament. So is it really that there is a degenerative process from the very beginning? Or is it because of just the way that um, our dogs walk, whether it's their, you know, dogs that are, uh, you know, free running or not, and, you know, what kind of a a process is undergoing in that ligament that is constantly under that pressure. So I don't think that you can isolate those two things, but certainly we do see those dogs that have fallen down the stairs and do exactly the kind of trauma that you see. Mm -hmm. I would say that the most of the time that the patients that we see, however, are very, very chronic cruciate tears. So this has been going on for a very long time before it's recognized. It's recognized by the owner because it's an automatically, on, on, now my dog is three-legged lame, but then they may recall that a year ago, they might've had an injury where you know their pet, their pet was lame for maybe a day or two, and then it went away and it never really crossed their mind again. Um, you know, Or it's just been, they notice that every now and then when they really work out hard, so they just don't really give it much thought as to how that might have been an injury that happened a year and a half ago. Um, So I would say that it's very rare that we see a dog that has an acute tear with absolutely no evidence of osteoarthritis or fibrous tissue formation. 
Um, they're always nice because you feel like you get them early, but I think that there's there's definitely that predisposition. So along with the factor that you were talking about, Chris, there's also the factor that there is a genetic uh, component to that. I don't know, you know what that heritability is, but I know that there have been studies, particularly in, um, in the Newfoundland uh, dog mm -hmm. where they had looked at um, some genetic markers and things of that to see you know, was there a genetic component to that? And I do believe that they did find that. Uh, again, I don't know how strong that was in that study. Um, and then you have the absolute confirmation of, of pets. So, you know, it, again, some of the early studies said, well, what is a normal angle um, for the tibial plateau? And, and that's a real loaded question as well, because it's talking about, well, what breed? We know that the normal angle in small breed dogs can be somewhere like 30 degrees. Whereas if we do a 30 degrees on a really big dog, that can really predispose them to a very early cruciate tear. Just because exactly what you said, the condyle wants to move down that slope and so it's not going to take a lot to rupture that cranial cruciate. Um, also, and, and we do see, before I leave that thought, we do see some, some breeds um, where we have seen uh, angles of 45 to 50 degrees. Wow. Um, in which then those dogs are rupturing at a very young age, like four months of age. Oh. So we do know that the tibial plateau angle does have a lot to bear with that. Um, but again, you know, it, it's so multifactorial in any particular dog that, you know, it's really hard to make a, I think, a blanket statement over everyone. Um, and then you have the, the dogs that are relatively posty legged, like the chows and, and pugs and some of the other dogs that have a very straight limb. Um, so if they're already straight, then it's not going to take a lot, you know, to um, to go ahead and, and rupture that cruise ship. So, you know, it, I hear the term um, craniate cruciate ligament disease used quite a bit. And, you know, is this, is this sort of what we're describing, this possibility of the osteoarthritis and the wear and tear? Um, or can you define a little bit what that cranial cruciate ligament disease, the meaning of it? Well, I think I think that's just a blanket statement that yeah. you know people make because we don't really because it is so we don't factorial. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't know. really know, and you know whether it is a an ongoing degenerative process in that particular patient. Although I think that is absolutely the most um, uh, believed uh, theory. You know, as far as you know that it is this ongoing you know um, degenerative process, but you know, generally there is some, um, you know, when you hear the history, there is some episode that either they were playing in the backyard or they were playing with another dog or they were chasing somebody, you know, um, that is the absolute point at which mm. the dog becomes, you know. Yeah, and squirrels, collapse. I think are, yeah, squirrels are the, I think the biggest. <laughs> I call it the squirrel's revenge. Yeah. Right, the squirrel's revenge. I think <laughs> that the squirrel is the cornerstone of veterinary rehab. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's something that it, that that happened uh, previous and then they they remember later, you know, while she had, she was lame last year, you know, so interesting. And I think you've, you've kind of answered this, but I just want to reiterate that, you know, cruciate tears, whether they're anterior cruciate tears in, in people or, or cranial cruciate tears in our animal friends, uh, they do occur across all species, all breeds, but there may be a disposition, a predisposition based on anatomy, conformation, lifestyle that would cause the tear to be more prevalent mm -hmm. in some versus others. Is that right? I think so. I mean, you know, certainly I think uh, probably all of us know many people that, you know, or their children that have had cranial cruciate tears. Um, they don't have to be professional football players. You know, they, mm -hmm. if they played sports of any kind or did any kind of skiing or whatever, um, you know, whether it's lacrosse, whether it's football in, in, in high school, um, you know, they, they can get a tear in very easily. So again, you know, um, most of our athletes, um, and certainly our dogs, again, we've talked about, and we do see it in cats as well. Um, and I think there was a recent report on using a TPLO in a llama um, that had twins. Wow. Oh, man. So we, do, we do know that, you know, I mean, they all have cranial cruciate ligaments. So, you know, the fact is that the same types of stresses that can 
cause that injury, um, you know, in another species is, is going to apply to them as well. I think the difference would be, you know, what is their conformational difference in terms of, you know, what is the tibial slope on those animals? You know, what is that part of it? Is it not part of it? Or, you know, are they very straight legged? And so it doesn't take much to, to do that tear if they get hit from the front or fall, you know, so I think that it's, it's really the confirmation of that patient. So Dr. Niamis, you mentioned that cats do get cruciate tears as do, you know, all species potentially. Um, and I actually rehabbed a, he was a Maine Coon. He was young. His name was Sam. And uh, he was a champ in terms of kind of putting up with our more traditional rehabilitation. They say that Maine Coons can be rather dog-like, but he walked in the underwater treadmill and he walked over Cavaletti's. In fact, he was a, a star on the website for a previous uh, place of employment because it was just such a great shot of him stepping over the Cavaletti's and, and so forth. So so that was kind of cool that that the owners, uh, you know, move forward with surgery on their, their cat, Sam, and um, you know, Kathy and I have talked about how cats are such amazing creatures that, you know, they, they, uh, oftentimes we don't see them in rehab period. Um, and, and if we do, it's for other things oftentimes. So anyway, that was an outlier. Yep. <laughs> and then I also want to mention, you know, you were talking about it being multifactorial and, and I definitely agree. And I try to allay, you know, owners, um, feelings of guilt because I think oftentimes they think it's because they, you know, threw that ball that one extra time or, or what have you. And because there are so many things that can impact. And I remember not too long ago, um, they were questioning why so many women basketball players were getting ACL tears. And I don't know if there was a conclusion, but I think some of the, the things they were looking at were hormones that are obviously different between male and female athletes. Um, and then also the type of training that they were they were doing and uh, that that it was maybe different than the male counterparts. And that was maybe leading to these tears. And also we know in general that females tend to have wider hips and narrower knees uh, causing a, what we call valgus and that that may have been a factor. So just. You know, from my days of being a people PT, uh, I remember, you know, they were they were trying to figure out why. Why it was happening so much in high school and collegiate uh, women basketball players? Well, you know, there are probably other factors, too, that they didn't even consider. And that is like, you know, what are their tennis shoes? Like? How mm -hmm. much are they gripping the floor? You know, um, you know, so much technology goes into professional players' um, shoes. And... And I, I wonder, really, are we really paying attention to that in the women's professional game? Well, and Kathy and I talk oftentimes about we're, we're obsessed with dogs' feet, but also traction and the importance of having good footing and preventing slipping. And, you know, to your point of talking about like hyperextension injuries and so forth. And I remember there was a time in football where all the fields were turning to turf. Yeah. And then they determined that. There were so many more injuries, particularly of the knees, when they went to turf fields because the the grass was actually more forgiving versus like their cleats right. sticking in the you know in the turf. And then what's the next thing to to give way? And it was their their ligaments and such. So, exactly. yeah, it really is complicated and uh, and fascinating. So we and we talked about um, this being multi uh, factorial. So or that that there's there there are several things that could lead to these dogs having CTL tears on their specific breeds and maybe their activity or maybe they've had a trauma um, or confirmation type. But, you know, there there are factors, I think, as well as uh, comorbidities, too. So we look at dogs with uh, maybe dogs that are, are obese. Um, are they at higher risk? Dogs with hip dysplasia or maybe dogs that have other um, conditions like dogs, these dogs that are Addisonian or dogs that are on uh, long term steroid uh treatments, you know, are those dogs also at higher risk for um, CCL tear? Well, you know, it, 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 um, it kind of goes both ways. I mean, certainly the obesity aspect, I, I tend to see uh, cruciate tears in cats more often when they're obese. Um, and I think it's, it's because it's not their day-to-day -day walking. It's just the fact that they may try to do something 
where a thinner cat might be able to accomplish that. And then an obese cat can't. And so they wind up falling or, you know, putting themselves in a situation where they're just not able to accommodate that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that, you know, obesity o- across the board is, is just such a problem um, for, mo- for many, many, many things. But uh, I just feel that um, certainly adding more weight uh, to those limbs doesn't help. Um, you know, I don't know that we see a propensity of dogs that are obese with cranial cruciate tears. Certainly we see a propensity of obese dogs, period. But I don't know that I'm really seeing it that much um, as far as, you know, that 90% of the dogs that we see with cranial cruciate have are obese dogs. I, I wouldn't uh-huh. say that. Um, so I'm sure that it plays some sort of a factor. But again, I think it would probably be having to weigh in with everything else that's going on in that obese dog. Mm. Um, so for instance, does a dog also have elbow dysplasia? And now is he throwing more of the weight back to the back legs? Um, because that's putting a lot more pressure on it. Um, in terms of you know hip dysplasia, um, I, I think that we see a lot of dogs that have hip dysplasia that also tear their cruciates. But dogs tend to, as you know, as a rehabber, they tend to, sh- to shift their weight to the front legs rather than shifting it over to the other side. You know, they tend to put more weight on the front. And then what happens is then they tend to, you know, um, be more hyper um, uh, hyperextended in that carpus and they'll lose range of motion in the carpus and things because they're shifting that weight and the, the rear end comes up, the head goes down, you know, to accommodate for, for that discomfort um, in the way that they're holding their knee. But I think one of the things that is really important to consider, especially when we're talking about repairs and what we anticipate and what a person may think is going to happen, is those dogs that do um, and the diabetics, um, the the cushionoid dogs, where you know these ligaments are really um, not the same; they're not as healthy, um, and they do tend to tear uh, much more quickly. Um, and then you know trying to get them stable because then you know if, if they're on pred you know, uh, how are they going to do as far as healing and, and infection? Um, and the other thing too, is that I find those dogs do not lay down much fibrous tissue. So if you're considering a technique that requires a lot of fibrous tissue, um, that, that's just not going to work um, because they're not going to lay down that scar tissue and they're never going to get stable. So, you know, I think it's really critical to understand the core morbidities and, you know, try to weigh, um, you know, the best options for them. So given this mixed bag and and all these variables, is there anything out there? I have have studies shown that there are things that that veterinary professionals can do, you know, maybe setting the stage early, you know, with nutrition and and things like that in a, a young puppy's life. Or you mentioned the Newfoundland study and maybe a genetic component that that breeders have the potential to breed out the propensity for, for tears, um, dog owners in terms of conditioning, um, you know, fitness, uh, do you know anything is, uh, do we, is there anything we can, we can do to, to help these numbers? Well, I don't, I, I, I guess I don't, my, I hate to give up, throw up my hands, but I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so because the fact is that, you know, dogs are such an intricate part of our lives. You know, um, people who, um, you know, love running through the woods with their dog, which I, I absolutely abhor um, because <laughs> I feel like you're just telling your dog to go play by the railroad um, station, but, um, you know, or your kid, you know, because the amount of injuries we see coming out of the woods, whether they're stick impalements, lacerations, fractures, you, you, you know, you name it, um, you know, and then there's this, comment, but he likes it. Well, you know, kids like playing near the railroad tracks too, but that doesn't mean it's a good thing. But again, you know, I think that, you know, if that is what makes the dog happy, if that is what makes the person happy, if that is their their life together with this companion, it's pretty hard for people, for you to tell them to stop doing it. You know, you may, you know, you may give them that, that um, you know, that advice, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be followed. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to take a dog that you know is a known athlete that is a worker. You know, you can't take a border collie and tell him not to run the dog. You know, 
um, it, it, that's just not going to work. And it, it, it didn't, it didn't work when you, you know, tell a, a high school senior who wants to play football that, you know, this could create Parkinson's, you know, later on in life because mm-hmm. of hand injury, mm-hmm. you know, that doesn't make parents not all of a sudden tell their kids they can't do sports, you know? And I think that, I think it's really similar that, you know, depending on the life of that, you know, the proposed life or, or joy of that, of that pet in that home, um, you have to kind of look at all of those things and just say, you know, that's what you've chosen and that's fine. Just understand that this is going to predispose us to, to this, you know, um, because as we know, our athletes, you know, even though they're, they're not obese, they're, they're hardworking um, and yet they're still, you know, they're getting appreciated. So I, I always think that not having an obese dog or not having an obese cat, I mean, that's like, that, that's kind of a no brainer. You, you don't want that. Mm-hmm. Um, just because of the multiple other problems, not even talking about cruciate problems, um, that that can create uh, for that animal and the life changing event that that creates for that animal, um, which is, you know, sad in and of itself. Um, but I, I don't know, you know, people say that to me all the time, you know, well, he's had one, how can I prevent the other? And, and, and there really isn't a way to prevent the other unless you're going to change what that animal does on a daily basis. And I, and I think that's very hard and, and also can then contribute to behavioral problems that then could really make things a mess. The, the carrying the other, uh, what is the statistic these days? I knew it was uh, greater than 50% tend to tear their, their contralateral or the opposite cruciate. I think we're really at like 30 to 50% is what okay. we usually tell Okay, and, and will all of these dogs, all of the all the dogs that have CCL tears, repair or no repair, are they going to develop osteoarthritis? I think so. I think yeah. the degree of osteoarthritis is what we're really talking about. Um, and again, what I would say is that ninety percent of the dogs that we see already have osteoarthritis, significant osteoarthritis, by the time we see them for treatment. And can can we talk a little bit about the difference in in full CCL tears in comparison or to, to partial tears? And how, how does that treatment differ? And, and maybe even how that prognosis differs? Well, I don't know that the treatment necessarily differs. Um, and I think what you do as a surgeon may be fairly controversial. So, um, you know, as to whether you're going to, you know, if, if we, if you happen to go into a stifle and you know, 99% of the cruciate is intact, you know, and there's just a few like one or two little fibers that are out of place, you know, do you remove the rest of the cruciate or do you not? And I think that's still pretty controversial as to whether you do or you don't. And we'll get to why that is maybe later. But um, th- but I think for the most part, um, a partial is just a full waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's not going to heal. Um, it will heal with fibrous tissue, um, which is of really no value um, or strength in trying to keep that joint stable. Um, so it's just going to be that one more episode um, that's going to finish it off. Hmm. Um, so many times we see partials, and in my mind, there's no reason to wait for surgery um, because you're, all you're doing is giving that um, that knee a, a a kind of a, a leg up, if you will, mm-hmm. or making more osteoarthritis on that on that knee. And you're better off to get them stable, get them stable as quickly as you can, and then move forward. Um, and and I, you know, when it, I, I never, tr- I try not to use the word repair. I try to slap myself on the wrist with that because we're really not repairing it, mm-hmm. you know, in any in any sense of the word. We are we are trying to make this stifle stable in 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 a some mechanism. In doing that, um, but we're really not going in and repairing the ligament per se. Um, you know, it just can't be done. And so, um, you know, the partial tear is is just a it's an it's just a gradation of time. You know, where this is early um, early in that process, and and how dogs deal with that is really different. I mean, some are super painful, and some are just kind of like they can handle it, and it's some like similar to people, you know, they can, some are more tolerant for pain and others are, are not tolerant at all. Um, so we, it's, we, it, and it's amazing between, uh, between patients, uh, you know, what will come in and, and I, I mean, I had a Rottweiler with a full tear who was weight bearing and coming in like she was, you know, right. like she was shot out of a cannon. Um, 
so you may not you may you're right you may not see that but the other the other thing i think it's it, is that um how do we know like I, so what what can what are you going to do in the exam room to diagnose either the full tear or the partial tear i mean is there, there there probably isn't any really way to know for sure how how partially torn it is until you get in there but there's a process for diagnosis yes yes and no um so if you have a an acute tear you know where you don't have a lot of scar tissue you don't have a medial buttress you you don't have thickening of the joint then you know then you um you look for instability you know whether you um look for cranial drawer or whether you look for tibial thrust um they're they're just done two different ways the cranial drawer is is where you have your hands tightly held um, one against the tibia and the other one on the femur and then just try to slide them away from one another uh, a complete tear there'll be complete motion and that tibia will be able to be brought forward um, with a partial tear that will only happen in in partial flexion of that knee because you're engaging um, that you know you're trying to see whether that caudal bundle of that cranial cruciate is torn um because the cranial cruciate will still be intact in many of those cases the cranial bundle of the cranial cruciate um once there's fibrous tissue once there's scar tissue it really becomes much more difficult to determine whether you have a partial or you have a complete there are times where i'm not able to get any um mobility any any type of a, a tibial thrust or a cranial drawer and i go in there and that cranial cruciate's nowhere to be found i mean it's been absorbed a long time ago and that's the power of the body and then its ability to, to lay down fibrous tissue the problem is it never really does it completely on a micro motion level and so then that knee just thickens up over the time over years to the point where really we don't have much range of motion. In terms of the the size of the dog, I know I've heard over the years that you know if it's a partial tear and you know it, it's a dog that's I don't know I'm going to make up something but under twenty pounds that maybe uh, they can do fine you know because there aren't so many of those forces you know across that that knee and it may not tear further or at least to the point that it's it's really affecting their their lifestyle is that true i don't think so um i think that what what plays into that is the expectation you know the expectation that little dogs aren't athletes um you know that they're not asked to do much you know that they're couch potatoes or you know they just want to be held all day so it really doesn't matter if their knee doesn't work that well mm. um and so i th i really think it comes down to what each owner develops or considers to be success right mm -hmm. um you know if you ask one person and they're perfectly happy they say their dog is very sedate you know they really just sleep most of the day and you know they don't really run around and they're perfectly confident so you know they're they're really not looking for you to make them a field trial dog um, whereas other people, you know, if you, if you have a Drac Russell Terrier, you know, more likely that's really not going to be the, the situation at all. Um, and I have had, um, Maltese that were agility dogs, mm -hmm. and certainly that was not the expectation from that particular owner. Um, you know, I've had coursing dachshunds, um, <laughs> where again, that's not the expectation. So, I really think it comes down to the fact that some people just think little dogs don't need to do as much because they're not athletes. Or and they I, carry them. Or they're, they're like, well, I'll carry you. Yeah, because <laughs> you're small. I think that's unfair. I think yeah, that it is. they undergo the same situations. Their knees get extremely thick and, and bothersome over the t over time. Um, I, I saw a patient, for some totally different, but they wanted me to look at the knees. And we had done a lateral suture on the dog um, probably at least four or five years before. And, you know, her knees are terrible. You know, they're they're really thick and, and painful. Um, and, you know, she's able to get around. She's, you know, 16 now, almost 17. So again, their expectations are low. But the thought is that you still have this older dog that is going through a lot of discomfort. And, the, and so then what are you going to do? You know, you have an older dog where are you gonna leave it on NSAIDs? You know, now you have a whole nother set of situations that really don't predispose for you treating them very effectively for pain. Um, and that, that to me is really sad. Yeah.
Yeah. I, I also, I feel like people project that they're little, like their toy breed little dog on three legs isn't a big deal. Looks kind of cute and it goes really fast. You right. see a Ridgeback or a Rottweiler or a, you know, Clumber Spaniel or whatever, you know, trying to negotiate on three legs and it just looks horrible. You know, it's, it, it, they, they, you know, just are not agile. It just looks so stressful and exhausting. And I think that may play into it a little bit too, you know. Well, and also, I can't tell you how many people I, I see that tell me that their dogs are not uncomfortable and yet they got <sighs> on weight bearing. I know. And I say yeah. to them, well, what makes you think that they're comfortable? Well, they're eating and they're still running around and they're having a good time. And I'm like, yes, but they're not using their leg. Like right. what would keep you from not using your limb? You know, do you think you'd be comfortable? And I think it's that perception that because they don't lose their limb and they're still getting around and they just forget that, you know, evolutionarily, these patients are not going to let themselves be in a situation where they're going to be prey. Whether they're ever going to be prey or not is a whole different situation, but they're not going to let that leg hamper them to move along. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they're comfortable. Right. And to your comment earlier about how dogs can, can mask and some do it pretty well in terms of their uh, pain tolerance and such. I, I just got a new client within the last couple of weeks who, classic story, uh, they, he uses the flinger, you know, and throws the, yeah. the ball across the field every Shut morning it. for about Shut 20 it. minutes. Yep. And she came up lame, went to the vet, diagnosed with a probable partial tear, and was put on anti-inflammatories and rest for two weeks, but she was fine. So he went back to that. This was in October, I think, that she had the original injury. So they went back to all their normal activities, including the the fetching. And uh, I saw her because he was worried, even though she was fairly asymptomatic, she would get up every morning and limp for a few steps. And I explained this is inflammation. She's got arthritis. You know, this is very classic. Within a week, she fully tore. Sure. But mm -hmm. even when I was there and I measured her thigh girth, she was, I think, three centimeters less muscle mass, i.e. more atrophy, on that leg that was originally injured in October. So again, even though she looked fine to the owner, she was playing ball, nothing, you know, ostensibly was, was wrong. She was not using that leg, not engaging that leg. She was protecting it and thus the muscles atrophied. And I think we see that a lot. Yes. Yeah, and if we could get that dog on a stance analyzer, you'd probably see. Oh right. yeah. It, you, you'd see for sure that that dog wasn't putting weight, you know, on that limb. It, it's just to the eye. It looks like she's running around and, mm -hmm. and playing mm -hmm. on all fours. You know? Yep. And I think videotape has helped a lot too. I always ask my clients if they can videotape because you can slow that down and sometimes see things, how they're cheating that, that again, our naked eye can't uh, capture. So that's, that's been valuable. Mm. So let's shift gears here a little bit. Um, so can you talk, Dr. Nieves, about surgical options and what those mean and, you know, versus conservative care and what that might mean long term in terms of prognosis, pros, cons, et cetera? Kind of break it down into more of a technique such as the TPLO or TTA versus um, the lateral suture. And the lateral suture has been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, the, the whole premise behind the lateral suture is, is that you are going to, um, you know, hold this knee in a somewhat normal position um, while the body uh, continues to lay down fibrous tissue and take over the role of that lateral suture. Because it's a piece of nylon, and over time that's going to break if the body did not lay down uh, the scar tissue that's required of it. Um, and, and so, you know, theoretically, these, these patients become more and more sound, but in doing so, they're also losing range of motion because you can't really have a lot of fibrous tissue and thickening of a stifle and not lose flexion. Um, and, and so these, these dogs will never have a normal sit 
Um, and then the issue is, you know, is this patient going to um, have sufficient amount of fibrous tissue to hold that joint, you know, for a very long time? And this it goes back to, you know, the diabetics and the other dogs that you see that, you know, maybe their cruciate's been ruptured for two months and it looks like day one. Um, that, that's obviously not a dog that's going to lay down a lot of fibrous tissue. So the lateral suture really may not be the treatment of choice. Mm-hmm. Um, the other issue I have with the lateral suture is that a lot of times, as I said before, these dogs already have a ton of fibrous tissue, really don't have much um, range of motion. They don't have um, any instability. And so really doing a lateral suture on that dog is of no value because the body's already done it. Um, and, and it's really not going to add anything to that patient. And uh, I, I know that that hasn't always been popular for me because, you know, I'll get a, a referral for doing a lateral suture on a small dog that already has knees that are so thick. And I'm mm-hmm. saying, this is not going to help your dog. You know, we can, we can certainly go into the joint, clean it out, look and see if there's a meniscal tear, you know, do whatever treatment we need to do as far as that goes. But then if we really want in, if we want to try to provide some stability and, and changing the biomechanics of that knee, then, you know, we're looking at either doing a TPLO or a TTA. And, you know, if they're not prepared for something that aggressive, then, you know, that can be really um, kind of shocking to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the TPLO and the TTA, really the function of that is to try to decrease that um, tibial plateau angle and to basically you know, somewhere between zero and five degrees. They just do it in a very different way. Um, I'm more comfortable doing the TPLO than the TTA, and that's just because that was my training. Um, I trained with Dr. Slocum, and so I still do it in the very classic way, and and that has gone through some iterations as well. And there's a lot of people who have taken that and and changed it um, to things that they're more comfortable with and, and they think work well for them. I've been doing it for a, a very long time in the classic way and, and still continue to love it. Um, I have done TTAs and I, I like doing them, but again, my comfort level is with a TPLO. And so um, I think it really comes down to choosing a surgeon and a technique that they're comfortable with and sticking with that um, and not trying to compare whether the TPLO or the TTA is better. Um, but you know what is best in that surgeon's hands Um, Certainly, there have been hundreds of articles um, written about TTA and TPLO and and who's better and who's not and and in vitro and vivos, you know, um, uh, studies to kind of look at weight bearing and and what kind of level of osteoarthritis is happening. But but basically, those techniques are are made to um, provide instant stability to that knee. Um, And then obviously, you've created a fracture, if you will, an osteotomy that then has to heal. And so that the part that I think is not always um, uh, or, or is of major concern and, and, and bothers people the most is that you have to keep them so quiet for so long um, because it takes time for the bone to heal and you can't make that go faster. Um, so, you know, you're looking at six weeks before really you can challenge that. And I know that I can be more strict about that than other surgeons. That's fine. Everybody has their their, um, you know, risks that they want to take. I'm just not a risk taker. Um, so the thing is that in for the TPLO or TTA, you're looking at a knee that is stable, not because it's got to live down any fibrous tissue. It, it is stable because of what you're doing biomechanically to change that. Um, whereas the lateral suture and all the counterparts of that, so the tightrope or any other kind of ligamentous thing, you're again looking at um, for the need to uh, basically lay down fibrous tissue um, and then take over the role of that uh, of that uh, band that you've put in there. The, the biggest issue with that is that you get them very tight and surgery with the, with the lateral suture. Um, so you feel like you really have that under control. And then, you know, uh, three or four weeks later, the nylon has stretched and now that patient is back in a cranial drawer position with that tibia forward. So now there, the, the, the fact is that that knee will always be in that an, not in improper, if you will, anatomic position. And so you really are not going to ever stop osteoarthritis in those patients. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So, and then it, it really does leave that meniscus in for a potential tear, which can still happen with the TPLO and TTA. It's just a, a much uh, lower uh, consequence of that as, as far as, or incidence, I should say, of that. Um, but, you know, it is a superior technique in terms of stabilizing the knee, realigning the knee the way it needs to be, and um, and really trying to uh, keep the level of osteoarthritis uh, down. Um, you, the more likely, you can't reverse um, the osteoarthritis that's there. Um, and if there's a meniscal injury, then the osteoarthritis will be even worse um, because that meniscus is a huge shock absorber and, and an important, um, you know, important uh, piece of material there within that joint shock absorber, um, you know, to keep that knee normal. And that that's a, the same in people as well. You, they went from taking out large pieces of the meniscus to really trying to avoid taking out any if they have to. Mm. When I see these dogs um, in, in in therapy, some and you have to be so careful with some of these TPLO dogs because I think you know when after they've had their you know cruciate ligament tear and now they've had their TPLO, and I see them and they're 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 weight bearing and they feel good, yeah, and they want to take they want to take off. You, you can't explain to them you just you know <laughs> surgery, but I think because they're in stand and they're stabilized in stand, they're like Yahoo. <laughs> right. And I and I think it's because you have to be careful to be really careful with them. Yeah. And I think it's even worse than small dogs. Small oh, dogs are like I mean, <laughs> they are quick, quick to use that leg, yeah. and they never look back. They, they never don't. look back. And they you're don't. like, whoa, buddy, you know, let's not be doing this. You know, and it, it is much harder for um, owners to keep a small dog from jumping up on a couch or things like that. But it's even more critical because you know after that. Uh, first post-op period, they are ready to go. Right. And they are just so quick to recover. Yeah. And uh, you have to remind owners that what we're doing in therapy is um, we're essentially rehabbing, you know, if you're doing a TPLO, if you have to think of it as rehabbing a fracture, you know, we're waiting for that right. that, that to heal. Uh, that makes a great segue into my next question about, um, you know, the role of rehabbers in in the treatment of dogs with CCL tears. And so, you know, I want to touch a little bit on your thoughts about what we, Chris and I often call prehab. Um, so I have, a, I have a patient and you'll probably be seeing her shortly. Um, she's a, a little pit bull with a, with a grade three luxating patella. And what we have determined, you know, is I, I mean, I can't, I can't fix that in, in therapy. It has to be repaired, but can I get this dog, uh, can I make her core strength better? Uh, can I address any, you know, compensatory related issues that she's that's associated with this this patella luxation? And can I get her in the best possible physical condition for the best possible outcome for recovery? Um, and then there's the dogs that have had surgery, and then they come, you know, to Chris and I, you know, post surgery for for uh, rehab to get them back to their function, you know, faster than hopefully fast faster hopefully. Uh, so I'm interested to hear about your thoughts about prehab and post op surgery rehab. Well, I mean, I think prehab is awesome. Um, again, it, it just comes down to, you know, obviously finances, you know. Yeah. Um, I think in an ideal world, I mean, that would be great um, just because oftentimes by the time surgical intervention is sought, you know, these patients have been gone on for months of not really being doing very much. And so overall, they're not very strong. Um, not to mention the, the limb that's in, affected, but uh, I mean, overall, they're just not, they're not really up to their game. Yeah. Um, and then, and now we're going to keep them down again for another six to eight weeks. And so um, I think having them come in, you know, with that, uh, you know, with some rehab and with them being stronger overall is, is always excellent. Um, I like to start my rehab at two weeks post-op. I know some rehabbers are not comfortable with that and that's fine. Um, others will start at four weeks. Um, and, but for me, it's only swimming. I, I don't want to put any stress on that plate or those screws or, you know, I don't want them to be on a physio ball. I don't want to do anything because I, and maybe that's my own inadequacies of knowing, you know, what could go wrong or what those stresses are on the screws, but I'm just not a risk taker. Um, you know, it, the, the consequences of having the screws break um, or having it fail it is just so overwhelming that I just don't want to go down that path. So for me, what I prefer is that, 
you know, we build them up, we make them strong, um, whether it's in the underwater treadmill or free swim, depends on some dogs I knew do, do better in the free swim. Others don't function very well at all. <laughs> the leg just hang, um, which is fine. And so then switching them over to the underwater treadmill where the water is really high, but they're doing resistance training. And so, you know, they're really working on that limb without really any weight bearing and, and really building up the muscle mass so that we don't have this, you know, this skinny little leg um, going into their walking um, therapy. Because as much as I, I love the walking therapy, not all dogs will perform as well. Um, so, you know, they, and we do start that at, at six weeks. Once I see radiographically that we have a good, good, you know, gain on healing, they don't have to be completely healed, but, you know, really um, you can still see the fracture site, but at the same time, we have a lot of, of remodeling and, and changes there. So I feel comfortable that they can start having some freedom in the house and, and do their walking. You know, some dogs are avid walkers and they're pullers and other dogs are just, you know, just kind of lope and still straight. And so again, you know, the quality of what we're really getting and, and what they're producing are two different things. And, and so the owner goes, well, I've gone through this, you know, I've gone through this six weeks of walking and, and now, okay, here I am, I'm ready to go off leash and, and hmm. you see them and, you know, they're, they're still like three centimeters, um, you know, uh, atrophied on, on the affected limb and, and we're not going to be ready. It's not that you're going to hurt the plate or do anything like that. It's just that, you know, I tend to see them externally rotate that stifle and, and do other things to accommodate and basically offload that stifle so that you're not, um, you're not going to build up that muscle mass. And so then, you know, they're disappointed because they take them out and they're sore and things of that sort. And you're like, well, you know, we still have a ways to go. And, and I think it's that disappointment. Well, I've done everything and yet it's yeah. not work. But now but, it's done. Yeah. And, and now it's well, over. And, and um, it's, it's not, you know, and not. You, you can't say, well, you haven't done because they have done it, but, but the dog hasn't done it. <laughs> and, so, and, I, and I think you know. rehab is one of those, it's an interesting field in that, you know, and, and I, I hope Chris will agree with this in that there's no like one uh, cookie cutter uh thing that I can use for every TPLO doc, right? right? Every patient has to be evaluated as an individual and one dog's recovery from a TPLO uh, may look different from another dog's recovery, even though they've had the same procedure. And so I think it's also really important for rehabbers to approach these dogs as individuals and not a cookie cutter like, okay, I take this dog, you know, at five days and do this and at 10 days and do this and at two weeks do this. I think you have to look at each patient as an individual and, and determine what those dogs needs are and, and what, what your goals are for those, for those dogs and where they're at in their recovery. And, and that's where I, you know, I put my confidence in, in the people that I send them to, you know, I, I, that is not my field and, you know, I'm not there to like second guess them. I, I can tell you what my right. concerns are and where I want them to be. Um, but I, I really give free hand to the, physical therapist as far as, you know, once we pass that, um, that point where I feel comfortable that it's healing, um, you know, to, to do what is necessary, you know, to build up that muscle mass. Um, right. And we all have the same goal because we don't want anything. We want, right. we don't want anything to break down. We all have the same, right. We all have the same goal. Absolutely. We have that dog back to function, right. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about like your, your kind of time frames post operatively and and I always tell folks too that every surgeon has their timelines in terms of when they can start certain activities and and we as rehabbers you know need to abide by those but the the other thing too is the timeline for that post operative x ray um, you know sometimes it's six weeks sometimes it's eight weeks sometimes it's ten weeks sometimes it's six and twelve weeks you know they get two. Uh, can you speak to that at all and, and why it's it's all over the, well, the board? Yeah, and I, I don't know why so long, um, and I'll tell you how I've tempered mine. So at four weeks, we would, that is the earliest, earliest, earliest we would expect to see anything radiographically. And so if I did them at four weeks, um, then I would have to repeat them four weeks later. And it's enough, it's so expensive as it is, you know, the whole procedure that I, I I kind of split the difference and say, okay, let's look at what we're going to be at six weeks. There are a few dogs still at six weeks that I'm a little worried because I'm not seeing much going on. And in those cases, then I'll run another one four weeks later. 
But for the most part, by doing them at six weeks, I'm catching pretty much 99% of dogs that I feel comfortable enough to allow them to have freedom in the house. Makes sense. Well, this has been this has been fantastic. I think we covered everything <laughs> about cranial cruciate ligament tears today. Um, everything as, from everything from C to L. Everything from the Get top it. of your to the top of your <laughs> yes, everything from the top of your tibia to the bottom of your femur. Um, <laughs> but as we're as we're closing up, um, Dr. Nieves, can you tell us is there is there one takeaway? Is there something you want to leave? our audience with? Well, I, I you know, it, it's, um, it's really a sad thing because of the finances, you know, because I feel like this is something that, yes, it's not going to kill your, your dog or your cat. Um, you know, it, it's not going to kill them, but it, it is an ongoing chronic pain and that is not going to go away, um, without surgery, you know, um, conservative management really doesn't work. Um, and long term, they're they're you know they're really going to be limited as to what they can do. And yes, they'll be an older dog, but they'll be an older dog in pain, and that's really sad to me. Uh, I think surgery is still your best bet. I think um, trying to get it done, you know, with a person that you're very comfortable with and that they're comfortable with their technique, um, and that you understand truly what the outcome is, is is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was great information. All the whole show, just uh, great information for our clients and for owners and for listeners. And um, what I'd like to do is, um, can you let us? Can you let our listeners know where people can find you? Um, well, I'm at um, I'm at Blue Pearl Veterinary Partners in Waltham, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and I work with a, a bunch of great surgeons. So I'm not the only one there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, There's um, a good team. It's a, it's a good team there. But surgeons are highly opinionated people, so. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody has their ways to do it. Um, as residents find out when they have to work with five different mentors. <laughs> but Dr. So and So said this. <laughs> so, um, and, wow. and, you know, and, it, and that's because we don't have all the answers. Um, yeah, we try, and we try to do what's best for our clients and, and our patients, and feel like um, like we're making the best decisions with them. Um, so, but you are going to come up with different opinions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we're all, you know, there's one thing we can all agree on is that, um, we're, like you said, we're, we're all just, we're all trying to make these dogs just, um, and cats just, um, get them back to not only their function, but the, but reconnecting with the, with joy, the things that bring them happiness, the things that, um, bond their relationship with their humans. So we all have that same mission. We want your pet to be pain-free. We want your pet to be happy and healthy. And we want you to continue to have this great existing relationship with your pet. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Takes a village. Well, it does. It really does. And if you have a pug, it takes two villages. I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Niemis. Thank you for all your you. time and expertise. And again, we're so privileged to have you in our community and, uh, and we want to get this information out there. So I know the, uh, the other veterinarians and certainly uh, lay people, pet owners will, will glean a lot of, of great uh, info yes. here. So thank you. Agreed. Thank you very much. Welcome. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to enableyourpet.com. Thank you and please tune in next time.